When you wake up, this is what you gotta do You gotta crush the day before it crushes you Every day I'm here to motivate Lead the way in the AM I don't want you to hear these words I need you to feel what I'm saying, oh no. You gotta crush the day before it crushes you You gotta crush the day before it crushes you In the building, Jimmy Wilson Motivation's coming, I can feel it First thing that you need to do Is crush the day before it crushes you Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Drewby. Welcome back to another exciting Day Crushers episode. You know what it is. It's where I go out into the community. I find my favorite men and women, and I invite them to be on and tell their story about how they crush the day before it crushes them. And today's guest is someone I'm very, very excited to have on. This is a very special episode, as it will likely be the last Day Crusher interview that we ever do simply because we are sunsetting this podcast and moving on into the Call the Damn Leads show. So if you're in sales and you're looking for a little motivation, you can always, always, always go back and listen to all of the previous Crushing the Day episodes. There are nearly 900 in total, so you cannot go a day without finding something to get your mind right and set you on the path to success. And also... When you jump into the Call the Damn Lead show, we're going to have fun. We're going to have motivation. We're going to have crazy stories. And I know if you're here anyway, you're likely an entrepreneur, small business owner of some sort. And I know you'll get a ton of value out of the new show. But I really am excited for today's guest. She's someone that I had the pleasure of meeting through a friend. I was setting up. I did a conversation. I did a call. She watched it intently. She paid attention. And when I put up the opportunity to work with me. She, I think, was the first person to jump in and go, hey, I want to know more. What's going to happen? How do I take and become the greatest version of myself? And I'm going to be honest, this lady is already doing a fantastic job, but I'm super excited to hear more of her story and to continue seeing her grow as a day crusher. And the final day crusher episode, please help me welcome my friend, Miss Anne Marie Crumby. What's up, dear? Yay! I feel like I'm in great company, the grand finale. That's like cheers and friends and, you know, all those shows that everyone look forward to that grand finale. I am in great company. Thank you for having me. (laughs) I appreciate you being here. I know how excited you were. And, you know, one of the reasons I am excited for you to be here is because, again, when we first met, you were like, I'm in. Tell me what I need to do. How do I be like Drewby? How do I grow and and take that step? And to be honest, it's a super honoring and humbling thing for me when I have anyone who says, hey, Drewby, I I, I believe you can help me. I want you to help me. Let's work together. And so, Emery, tell the folks a little. I mean, I've had the pleasure of knowing a little bit about you. But, I mean, tell the folks about your story because you've come a long way to be where you are. But let's kind of start at the beginning. I mean, how did you even end up in the U.S. to begin with? Oh, goodness gracious. Let's go way back, decades. <laughs> <laughs> I was born and raised in on the tropical island of Jamaica. And I had to say that I'm a natural at sales. And being, being born and raised in Jamaica, it dates back to when I was, say, around five years old. I was in charge of my mom's home-based bakery business. So I was always very passionate about the needs of others and managed to serve my neighbors and with utmost care and compassion while ensuring a margin of profitability for my mom's business. So that was the genesis of my existence after I'm able to walk on my own, talk on my own, I started my business. And then I been raised, I was raised by a single parent and a single mom. And I know people get it all messed up these days. People are saying they're a single parent or they're a single mom. Well, my mom was both. She was unwed and she was a single parent of four of us. So my most vivid memory of my mom is nothing but struggle. And at one point in my life, 
it always makes me so emotional when, when I get to this part of my history. But at one point in my life, it was just so hard for her to afford to keep all her kids that she sent me off to live with my uncle and his wife. Me being the oldest daughter, it was like the best choice because in her mind, I would be the one that would be most able to take care of myself away from home. And that was a very difficult time in my life because my aunt, my uncle's wife, was she was extremely abusive. So much so that my big brother, he was at the time a young adult in the U.S., and he had to fly back home to Jamaica to accompany my mom to move me back home. And then shortly thereafter, another uncle and his wife took me in and they gave me that stability and love that I, I craved because I didn't have a father figure in my life. It was just my single mom just struggling. And now I was at a home where there's a father and there were kids saying, dad, Oh, I yearn to say that I so wanted that word to come out of my mouth, but you know, I still had to say uncle because he was really my uncle, but essentially he passed away at a very young age after several years as the mayor of Montego Bay. And he passed away really too soon because I wish he was around for me to, to repay him. Although there's, I couldn't, there's not, I wouldn't be able to repay him and his wife for what they have done for me. But soon thereafter, as a young adult, there were little times in my life where I was homeless before I eventually got a job with the Jamaica Tourist Board and I work at the airport there. And that was the beginning of my journey to the U.S. Uh, so just you've been on it since you were young, just yes. putting in the work <laughs> and doing whatever it took to keep surviving. I mean, that's such a powerful story. Oh, yes. and I, I can imagine, you know, what a young lady going through that must feel like and the, the different emotions. And I, I mean, I can see in your eyes the, the emotion. And I'm sure people can hear it as they're listening to the story. And, yeah. and what I love about that is it really does, you know, emphasize that day crusher mentality. You've had it since you were a kid. It's funny that you listen and, you know, you tell me about you listen to the podcast and you love, you know, the motivation. And I just think, you know, when I think of crushing the day, I think of someone like you. I think of someone who's had, you know, that up and coming and, and done whatever it takes to survive and, and been able to look at the world and go, hey, I know you're going to take me out if I'm not willing to do what it takes to survive. And, and you have just absolutely epitomized that. And I know, I mean, this is just the beginning of your journey we're talking about. I mean, you're, you've got yeah. so much more amazing things that we get a chance to, that we're going to talk about here. And, and one of those things that I'd like to know kind of you know, as a, a tactical takeaway for anyone who listens to this is, you know, if you have someone in your life where you recognize that they're younger and they're seeking that guidance and that wisdom, would you say there's any sort of advice that you could give to someone if they have a younger person in their life that they'd like to offer some guidance and wisdom on how to, to maybe approach that conversation so that it's comfortable? The conversation of their struggles yeah just so you know if you notice that there's someone in your life that's younger and they're going through it like what might be a good way to kind of approach that and, and try to offer some help for someone if they can oh okay yes they gotta you've got to show the world and your your why and the day crushers for me is something that I embodied every time I hike, every time I walk, I have the, the day crusher playing in my head. And so I learned a lot of how to approach things in life that is probably were laying dormant inside of me. And so what I can share is what is what I have learned from just listening to the day crusher, which is that you've got to show the world your why and, and just at, accept the fact that wherever you are right now, it's the circumstances of what you did, because we all live in the residual and yesterday input is today's output. So mm. you've got to be ready to impart that and someone else that wants to be in your today. Acknowledge and make them aware of the blueprint. They're setting the blueprint for their future today. 
Mm. So you have to be cognizant of what you're doing today because today is going to be your tomorrow. So that is what I would pour into someone that says, well, how do I, how do I get to where you are today? Because I know that there are people who are out there would be so happy to trade places with me right now. I mean, we, we only need to look as far as the Southern border Mm -hmm. and you know, there are many that would want to trade places with us. So for that and many other reasons, I would advise people to just be very aware of your today. That is that's your tomorrow. That's beautiful. And I love that advice because it's, it's something that, I think setting the example is a great way to reach such a wide audience of people and whether they're younger or mm-hmm. older, wherever they are in their journey of, of crushing the day, you setting the example of yeah. what's possible in your life is really a great way to show others and, and that willingness to say, Hey, if you want to know, I'll share it with you. And, and you know, that, that is what I believe is really going to change the world for the the better in the future is folks like you who are saying, Hey, I'm, I'm here and I'm happy and I'm blessed. And I always want to learn more. And also the things that you're learning, I know you're taking back to teach to the people that you come in contact with and, and you're always going above always. and beyond to educate. And it's yeah. one of the reasons I love you of the many and Marie. So <laughs> All right. There's a lot of great stuff we can talk about. So I want to talk about a lot of cool things on this episode, because again, you are the epitome of of what I believe crushing the day looks like. And so you, you, you get in with the tourist board, you're working at the airport. What get like, what was the catalyst that brought you to the States? And let's talk about kind of that early journey on in the States there. So when I, the, the catalyst that really brought me to the state was my, my brother, he would send pictures back home of beautiful Christmas trees. We have never seen Christmas trees before. And they're all so beautifully decorated. And America just seems so beautiful. And eventually he says, well, I'm going to petition the embassy to get all my sisters and my mom to the United States. And we were, we were just all so excited. But it was, it was going to be such a long wait for him to do it. So he had to circumvent the process and take mom first because it makes it a lot easier for mm. mom to take her kids. Then it, it became quicker. So that's how I made it to the United States. And then when I got to the United States, it was not what I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't look like anything in the pictures. It wasn't streets of gold. It wasn't as beautiful. I didn't expect to see trash on the streets and stuff like that. It was it was quite a shock and, and a disappointment, to be honest. <laughs> and um, and then my first indoctrinated into winter, I was like, "What is this? I want to go back home." Mm-hmm. And because. You got to walk in this thing called snow to get to the bus and you got to wait in in this open shed, the bus stop. And it was just freezing cold and I cried frozen tears. I just Mm. wanted to go back home. And my brothers told me that it would get better. And he got me a job at different places. But eventually I got a job at a dry cleaner's. And then somebody at the dry cleaners told me about a secretarial school and I inquired and started taking secretarial courses after, after work at the dry cleaners. And then after school, I would be the, what they call at that time, we were the closer. So we would go into McDonald's and we would clean the restaurants, including mm-hmm. the bathrooms for the day shift. So my day was really dry cleaners, Secretarial school, McDonald's, a little sleep, go back to the dry cleaners. And that was just really my life in the U.S. At the, <laughs> when I first started, I didn't have a car, so I had to take bus to the next bus to the next bus. And it was quite frightening. It, it really was. But it got better. 
And while working at the dry cleaners, one of the customer there, she recognized my hard work and she just take a liking into me. And she, she, she talked and I told her that I go to school after work. And she told me that when I graduate secretarial school to definitely let her know, and she'll get me a job with the state government. I didn't know what the state government is, mm-hmm. but she said, she'll get me a job. So I got to be better, better than the dry cleaners. And so when I, when I graduated, she came through for me. She really got me a job at the state government. And the next rude awakening, when I started there as a clerk, I started to learn that there was a thing called tuition reimbursement. And I was like, what is that? And they start to explain to me that if you go to college, if you take college courses, your employer will reimburse you. And it's like, that can't be possible. They're going to pay you to go to school. And I just couldn't understand why everyone wasn't doing it if it was real. Mm -hmm. And so once I validated that, I started taking my college courses and graduated from Central Connecticut State University. And then I did my post-grad. But those were some very long, cold nights. After, after yeah. work to go go to, go to school. <laughs> but I, I can only imagine the value of that. And, and again, it's why I know moving kind of into the next series of stories we're going to talk about, why you were able to get through all of those tough times that you continue to, you know, experience on your journey. Because we all have hard times, right? There, there's no continuous, yeah. like, constant rocket ship to the moon in life. At some point, you come back down through the valley and you got to go through it. And so... Yeah. That, that mindset that you're developing and the work ethic that you've created to just keep showing up and doing these things. And I love that willingness to explore opportunity, right? Because that to me is what really allows someone to take that journey. I mean, shoot, I, I walked away from a business that I was a part of for five years to go all in on starting Call the Damn Leads. And it's I would have mm-hmm. never done that five years ago. Five years ago, I was afraid to leave a $30,000 a year job to like, I don't know, what am I going to do? And this time I left a $300,000 a year job. Like it's, there's always these ups and these downs in this journey. And so what I really right. appreciate is how you've, you know, embraced the grind and, and the willingness to do whatever you need to do, which I know led you into eventually getting into to the real estate world. And building up a relatively big portfolio and and then running into 2008 and kind of experiencing what a lot of people did. So let's kind of jump into, you know, you you build a very big successful business, you're running good, and then what happens? Yes. Yeah, so that was a really scary transition because I was at state government. I'm getting a, a what I thought was a security because I have my paycheck biweekly, all the bells and whistles, healthcare and all that stuff. And then, then the transition came, just like in presidential election, the, the administration changed. And I was so higher up the rank by that time, I was an executive for a commissioner to the to the to the governor. And so when the transition came, we all had to scramble for something to do for for, mm. for a spot. And they were going to put me in a spot which was a step back. At the time I have my bachelor's degree and then they they were going to sign me to a secretarial job and I was like I'm not going back. I rather leave this job than go back. And mm-hmm. people were like are you serious? You're going to leave your, your guaranteed income and help. I'm like, yes, I am. I'm not going back. And so I left and yep, I left that, that secured job and started my real estate business. By then I was licensed before I left the state. I was doing real estate part-time. So it was an easy transition for me. I bought the building, had my business in there, had some rental. It was a mixed use property. So I had those rental tenants that took care of the overhead for my business basically at that time. And then I got into flipping. I was flipping so many properties. I flipped over a hundred properties in my flip and fix and flip days. But when the market crashed, I was left holding 17 properties. And at that time, some of those 17 properties were four units, four families. So Mm. one property, I have four families to deal with and everyone's facing hard times. So they're not paying rent. 
My full-time realtors are now part-time realtors, and some of them left for a W-2 job. So things were begin to like war its ugly head financially. And then the tenants, I swear to you, there's got to be like a little tenant society, how to screw your landlord and get away with it. Because all these tenants figured out how to file motions with this court so that they could stain your property and not pay you rent. And Connecticut being a judicial state, it could take years for you to even be able to evict a tenant. Crazy. So it started to to really, it was a financial hardship for me at the time. So I had to start doing short sales on my properties and even my primary residence that I love so much and put so much into. I had to do a short sale on that as well and got rid of lots of my luxury. But what I learned from that crash is that a lot of the things that I thought I needed like two Hummers, an RV, a Ford F-150, you know, the big house and the big lot and the gated and all these things that I thought I needed. That crash taught me that I didn't. Life was so simple after that and so relaxed and, and so easy once I was able to get past that downturn of the crash. And I, I just never thought I could live without my Hummers. <laughs> but I most, I most certainly learned a lesson the hard way. And now I'm very apprehensive about how I invest in real estate. I will not buy that many properties it, to, to fix and flip ever again. If I'm doing it, it would be one at a time. I, I don't finance my vehicles anymore. I make sure that my mortgage, my equity is at least 90% of my house. So the little 10% that I owe on it, nobody's going to be able to foreclose on that 10% because I'll be able to afford to keep my house. So Beautiful. I'm very, very timid with how I approach life now. Yeah. And you know, that yeah. that's the beauty of having those experiences though is it's not fun to go through them, but the lessons that we learn and the things that yeah. we get to take away from them are, are invaluable lessons, right? And, and my wife and I, we've talked about this yes. and, you know, we've had those years where we made lots of money and we went and we traveled and we had the luxury goods and the bags and the things, and those are all nice and there's nothing against them. Yes. It's you just know, that I for us, yep. as, <laughs> as we've learned and experienced, it's like, hey, that bag, while it's beautiful, it only comes out a couple times a year and we could be using that to go and do, you know, this other thing. We could set a family vacation or a memory or something that we really will get to take with us forever versus, you know, and again, it's success is perspective. That's what I really want everyone to take away from this is your version mm -hmm. of success is going to be different than what I see and is different than what our parents saw for us. I mean, Emory, I know what your mom sees in you and how proud she is to see what you've been able to accomplish coming from such humble beginnings. I mean, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. And I know that you have big vision for your children and all the things that you want to do and, you know, and, and keep growing with. And so yeah. you, you, you come out of the crash, you learn a lot of lessons, you continue on, you <laughs> rebuild, you, you're, you're at a point now where, I mean, you've been able to not just build a successful real estate brokerage with you and your husband, but now you've explored into some other opportunities and you've really focused in on helping real estate and, and, and potential investors protecting their legacy and their wealth because of your experience with having that going through that crash you've kind of shifted and you've created this mission for yourself of really helping people protect their their wealth, right? And and leaving that legacy. Right. So talk about what kind of made you decide, hey, this is the the shift that I want to move into versus just buying and selling real estate, which can be great. What made you decide to focus in on the, the real long-term legacy of things? Uh, primarily because I have gone through that financial ringer you know, running the successful real estate brokerage firm and and then losing it, had it all slipped through my finger and recognizing that that part of what contributed to that is because I didn't have the financial literacy of knowing how to invest and control my money. So I was making a lot of money and 
Connecticut, the tax man takes a lot of it too, but I was still <laughs> left with a lot. <laughs> but it, it all <laughs> slipped through my fingers and I saw how I missed out on enjoying the wealth that I've worked so hard to build over the years. So now I'm all about taking the reins off of, of your finances and making it work for you to build wealth all while keeping things rock solid and predictable with, with some sound economic know-how for like a lasting legacy. So mm. it's not rolling the dice. And, and this is where the infinite banking comes in. It plays a role that I can bring my expertise in real estate to the concept of infinite banking because it's easily relatable to someone who has gone through the real estate process. And it's easy for me to explain or to educate people on the fact that infinite banking is not a product. It is basically a concept that allows an individual to capture the opportunity cost of their money. The, the whole idea is, is to recapture the interest that one is paying to banks and finance companies for major purchases such as automobiles, education, real estate, and investment opportunities. So it really is a great way to become your own banker instead of paying interest to the finance companies or to hard money lenders. Now, if you, if you em embrace the infinite banking concept, those interests that are a escaping you and, and going to the fat cats at the bank, you can now recapture that and, and basically invest in yourself and you have your own financial powerhouse from doing it, that. It's such an interesting concept that so many people aren't aware of. And unfortunately, a lot of folks that are in the space don't make it as easy to understand as you do which is why I know so many people enjoy working with you and, and having that expertise of not just understanding the concept, but understanding truly what it means to have earned it all and lost it all and wanting to make yes. sure that protection is in place because you're right. I mean, the bank's going to make money. If you're going to need money for something, you're going to have to get it from somewhere. Some of you yeah. may already be making good money and have it in a bank and know that you can't just go to the bank and take 150 or $200,000 out of it. Or they're, they're going to be like, well, hold on a second now. Like we got to do all these, like this is a situation where you can put your money in a place that's protected by you, controlled by you. And then if you want to borrow it, you don't have to pay interest to the bank to get access to your money. You just right. go and get your money and it keeps growing. And again, I can, I'm butchering it cause I'm not I'm the expert that you it. are, but I'm like, no, 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 no. That's, that's how it works. It keeps growing uninterrupted compounding interest. So you put, for example, $5,000 into infinite banking, and I'm really starting low so people can understand that anyone can do this. Mm -hmm. And you put $5,000 in an infinite banking concept, and you're making car payments off what it is now, probably 500? I don't know what car payments are, but let's say someone's making $500 a month to, to um, the finance company for their car. They can take 92% of that cash value of that $5,000, no questions asked, no credit checks, nothing, but a bing, but a bang, you get your check in the mail or you get it wired to you. Mm. Now, what you do, instead of sending that money that you are sending to the finance company, you send it to yourself. So this is not a, a, a system or a concept that you're going to say, oh, well, so I got that money out. Now I'm going to go shopping. No, you have to be responsible. And that is <laughs> why my ideal clients are typically financially stable individuals that are seeking long-term wealth accumulation and tax advantages are asset protection. It's really not for in, irresponsible in, in individuals, but it, it is a great concept because now you're paying yourself back. Well, for example, well, my husband and I, we just did a, a policy and we first started out with my policy. Then I took a 92% loan from my cash value to, to open up my husband's policy. Then mm. we took a 92% loan from my husband's policy to pay off for a credit card bill. So now what we do, we still 
pay that measly 4% interest to the insurance company because the loan comes from the general insurance fund. Your money is uninterrupted. So it's still there accumulating compounding interest. Plus you got dividends, plus you get the bonus of a life of a death benefit. But anyway, so we pay that 4% and then the 12% that we were paying to our credit card, we were paying 12% on our credit card. We can do, we pay that extra, that difference, 8% back to ourselves. So our payment is still that 12%. There's no additional expense that we have taken on. We still pay the 12%, just that 8% goes to the insurance company general fund. And the 4%, I mean, goes to the insurance company general fund and the 8% goes to us. It's basically so just, are it's protecting yourself. That's it. it. It's just setting yourself yes. up so that you yes. don't have to pay extra interest to somebody else. You just pay yourself and you pay off your debts. And it's, again, this is why we have experts like you. So if someone is interested in learning more about this, this is a great place for a real estate investor or someone who is thinking long-term and how they can protect themselves. 100%, we will have them reach out to you. We're going to make sure we put all your contact information in the show notes and all that so that they can get a hold of you. And I mean, this has been an absolutely amazing episode and I'm sure we could chat all day long and, and keep going on, but... I wanted to, I really wanted to bring you on so that we could share your story because again, coming from such humble beginnings to see what you've gone through, what you've accomplished, having lost it and knowing that you've rebuilt it and you're 10 times better than you were and we're on a pace to, I mean, shoot, I know that you're going to continue absolutely crushing it, Emory, which is why, you know, maybe someday you'll get yeah. to take on hosting this show and, and doing interviews with people. That could be fun. Yeah, that but, definitely would be fun. <laughs> but before we get out of here, what's the best way for someone to come and find you if they did want to learn about you or, or find out more about how you can help with their you know future legacy? What's the best way them uh, to reach out to you? Okay, so they can reach out to me. I'm on social, all the social platforms at Crumbie and Co. So it's C-R-U-M-B-I-E, which is my last name, and Co, which is short name for company. Mm -hmm. And my website is crumbyandco.com. And I, I would like to say one last thing, though, if I may. Please, come on. Okay. So I, I just want to reemphasize to people the importance of finding the right terrain. Because for me personally, I've bounced around a lot. I've bounced around to different companies, different experiences. And that day when I listened to, to when I watched Juby presented on that, that Zoom webinar, the content was, it resonated with me primarily because I was already pre-exposed to it, but also there was just something in, in your soul that just spoke to my soul that tells me, this is the one, this is the person that needed to come into your life at this time. And you've just got to be open and ready for that. You, you'll never have adequate resources to win, no matter how hard you try, if you're not in the right terrain. And I was mm -hmm. not on the right terrain, and I am now. Think of a fight between a crocodile and a beer, a grizzly beer. It's the terrain that will decide the winner. Mm. It's not how big and bad that grizzly bear is. It's not how many teeth that crocodile has. It's going to be the terrain. So if you want to win, you've got to come to the right terrain, which is where I am. Ooh, mic drop. That's it. That's the best I've ever heard. I love that. And it's, it's absolutely true. It's why the day crusher mentality started. It's understanding that you put yourself in the right place at the right time with the right people, and that's when the right things start happening. And Anne-Marie, I couldn't be more grateful to have met you in that moment and know that we are on the right place and the right time and just all the amazing things that you are going to continue doing and absolutely serving the community. So thank you for being a part of this journey. Thank you for believing in me, for believing, more importantly, in yourself and for being a part of the Day Crusher community. It has been such an honor to have you on the show, and I know that there couldn't have been a better last guest for this. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your time today. Thank you. I greatly appreciate the opportunity, Drew Lee.
You got it. And you guys know, if you listened to this, if you liked it, this is the last show, but it's not over. Make sure you subscribe and tune in to Call the Damn Leads. We're going to be taking all the day crusher mentality. We're going to be carrying on the legacy, and we're going to keep crushing the day before it crushes you. And so, as always, get out there. Take care of business. We'll see you on the next one. Bye, y'all. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to go back and check out all the previous episodes. Make sure you subscribe and share this podcast with other like-minded, success-driven individuals who want to crush it. Check the show notes and grab your Crush of the Day swag over at crushingtheday.com. And remember, crush the day before it crushes you. You gotta crush the day before it crushes you.